problem since my town is known as the jack-o'-lantern capital of the United States. Every year, my town is host to thousands if not millions of carved horrors, and it has become a point of pride for our home Midwestern town. Our town has been full of pumpkins since its founding back in the 1800s, and now the town was filmed with glowing, grinning gourds from September till April. Most backyards had a greenhouse. The public commons had three large greenhouses that grew pumpkins during the cold months, and no citizen had to pay for a pumpkin. I'm pretty sure that came out of their taxes. I grew up carving, eating, and hating pumpkins with a red-hot fury. As a child, the glowing gourds had frightened me. My parents were never sure why, but I was terrified of them. Until I was seven, I refused to even carve one, and I remember getting in trouble several times for pushing them off our front porch. It never stopped a new one from appearing where the old one had been, and the stern talking to of wasting pumpkins always came as well. Pumpkins were a hot commodity in my town, and not something to be squandered. By the time I was 17, my fear had turned into a deep hatred. We were sitting on the commons, a big green expanse near the city hall that had acted as a sort of park when I got the idea. Hey, what if we pulled a prank on Halloween? Like a big prank. Chris looked up, cigarette smoke curling up across his face, while Kevin leaned over his handlebars and stared stupidly at me. What kind of prank? asked Chris, smoke curling from his lips. Chris was a typical greasy teenage troublemaker. Leather jacket, ripped jeans, black boots, and constant need to smoke a cigarette. He usually lifted one from his dad. Something big. Something that will never be forgotten, I said grinning hugely. I was watching them unload a wagon of pumpkins from the greenhouse as we loitered on the commons, wanting nothing so much as to watch them all become compost. Maybe some soap in the fountain again? Kevin asked dumbly. Kevin was certainly not as intimidating as Chris. If Chris looked like a greaser, then Kevin looked like a generic Chad. Blonde hair, blue eyes, tap out shirt, gold chain, wind pants, and lots of pictures in his phone of his well-crafted physique. Kevin and Chris had been my friends for a long time, but I mostly just used them as muscle. I wanted them on this case in case things went south, and something had potential to go very wrong very quickly. Oh, Kevin, something a little bigger this time. I'm thinking about maybe smashing some pumpkins on Halloween night. Kevin grinned, but Chris raised a pierced eyebrow at me. Are you kidding? You know how anal this town is about those damned pumpkins. If we go around people's houses and smash up their jack-o'-lanterns, I'm not talking about the ones at people's houses. I want to smash all the pumpkins. The ones at the houses, the shops, and the display ones. The two of them looked at me in stunned silence. By morning, I don't want a single jack-o'-lantern in the whole town. Kevin grinned like a shot fox, nodding his head and raising his hand for a high five, which I gave him. Chris didn't say anything for a few seconds, but his lips were slowly creeping into a distinctly evil smile as he thought over the implications. Chris was smart, probably smarter than I was, but he loved a good trick. And the idea of all townspeople seeing their pumpkins smashed, their town pride destroyed, made him grin. We'd be legends, more than legends, we'd be infamous, he said as he raised his hand for a high five. I slapped it. Boys, I guarantee the day after Halloween will go down in town history we're done. I had no idea how right I was. We began making our plans right away. Halloween was five days from now, and we had to make sure that we could commit our prank and 
get away with it unscathed. Being arrested for a stunt that would only elevate our street cred. But I was honestly a little worried about how the town would take what we were getting ready to do. As we passed through downtown on our bikes, I saw the shops littered with pumpkins. The plaque that commemorated when the world's largest pumpkin had come through with the fair one year and the display tables of pumpkins outside the jack-o'-lantern museum. I thought again about how vital the stupid things were to our town. We could get in real trouble for what we were about to do. So the first order of business was masks. They need to be full face masks too, Chris put in. I don't want them to see our hair or our noses and identify us somehow. Kevin laughed. Easy. My bro and I are heading to Saber Friday night. You guys slide me some money for masks and I'll bring back some quality masks. I looked at Chris and he looked back at me. This was a big ask from Kevin, the guy who still got lost on his way to school sometimes. Kevin's role in the gang was muscle, that was obvious, and trusting him with something like this was a stretch. If he got distracted when he and his bro got there, we could get it. We could be out of money and not have mass for this caper. Chris was right when he said that full face masks would be a must, and the shops in town wouldn't have what we were looking for. Kevin noticed our looks and got a little angry. Oh, come on, guys, I can do this. Do you want a good mask or not? We finally decided just to give Kevin some money and take our chances. We each gave him a 20 and said he better not forget to spend it on crap. He better not forget and spend it on crap. The next five days were agony. We couldn't tell anyone what we were planning to do that would ruin the prank, but we still had to make sure that we had an alibi. Our friend Mark was having a Halloween party that night, and we told him we would be there. People would see us, they would remember we had been there, and we could sneak out at 9.30 and be back before any of their boo-soaked brains had the time to miss us. I didn't sleep well that week, though. I was plagued with dreams. Dreams that I would stagger awake from and then fall back into as soon as I closed my eyes. I saw myself smashing a jack-o'-lantern after jack-o'-lantern. And all the while, something watched me from the thick fog that surrounded everything. I could see it, but it was big, and its red eyes seemed pleased by what I was doing. Now and again, I would raise my bat and salute to the mysterious figure, and it would rear back and cackle like a demon. We seemed to plan constantly that week. Use our bikes as transportation. We decided since they could cut around with less notice than a car and were faster than moving on foot, we figured we'd have about an hour and a half to pull this off before the devastation was noticed and speed would be critical to the operation. We had some baseball bats in my shed that we planned to use and began to map out our route. As long as Kevin got the masks, we'd be home free. He winked at us Friday afternoon as his brother came to pick him up from school. Don't forget, I reminded him. He scoffed. I've got this, guys. Chris sent me a text later that night saying, I still haven't heard from Kevin. I sighed and buried my face against the pillow. Kevin better not have flaked. Chris came over the next morning and found me in my garage. I was oiling my chain on my bike when he pulled up, preparing for tonight, and he looked put out. I could guess the source of his anger. Kevin had been radio silent since yesterday at school. Not a text, not a call, nothing. He forgot, he forgot.
got and you know it, Chris said. We don't know that, I said trying to remain positive. Chris could be volatile and was prone to moodiness sometimes. I didn't want him bailing out at the last minute. He won't return my texts and his phone goes straight to voicemail. If he and his brother spent the night in Swaver, we could be screwed. I started to speak, but that moment, Kevin pulled into my driveway with a paper bag under his arm and a big grin on his face. Sorry, boys, he said as he screeched to a halt. I dropped my phone in a puddle five minutes after we got there. Not to worry, I said. As long as he got the masks, he grinned. A grin that threatened to cut his head in half. Oh, I got the masks. I think you'll find them very fitting, too. I reached into the bag and pulled out a ghoulish orange mask that made me grin as well. The thick plastic looked like a demented jack-o'-lantern. Its gaping black mouth cut into a frightening double row of teeth. Its black eyes angled with malice and I could see a big plastic roach crawling from its nostril as, it, as I took it in. It was perfect. I couldn't believe that Kevin had picked these out. It would be fitting to attack their established idol with the likeness of them. Chris was grinning as he looked at his, and I could tell that all his anxiety had dissipated. Kevin, these are perfect. Tonight we're going to make history. The night, that night, we set off on our bikes. Bats and masks stored in our backpacks, along with the required six packs of beer to get into the party. We arrived at Mark's party around nine, the festivities already in full swing. It was your typical high school underage drinking party. Lots of people making out in the living room, a collective of smoke clouds around the back or out front, people dancing around to loud music, and a kitchen that was five parts wet bar and five parts buffet. Mark's parents were out of town, they always seemed to be out of town, and Mark's house was typically the place where parties happened. We stood around and sipped warm beer, keeping an eye on our watches. We didn't want to be here too long, just long enough to get noticed. We said hi to some people from school, played a few rounds of beer pong, and at 9.45, we slipped out and took our bike off quietly. We had planned our routes all day. Chris would take 1st through 16th Street, Kevin would take 17th through 10th, and I would take 11th through 15th. There, we, there were roughly 5 to 10 houses per street. And we would, meet up t <clears throat> we would meet up downtown when we were done. If we got done early, we would start smashing pumpkins downtown and wait for the others. If the cops came, we could run, leading them away, so the others could keep smashing. They would not assume we were organized. They would think we were holiday pranksters out for fun. If they grabbed one of us, the other two could finish the night's work before they were the wiser, hopefully anyway. We split off at 10 o'clock. The front porch, porch's dark save or the glow of the jacks and their trick-or-treaters mostly gone. I slipped on my mask as I came to 11th Street, grinning beneath as I freed my bat from my pack. The first gourd, my bat hit, exploded in a shower of orange and wet flesh. I smiled beneath the mask, smashing the other two and moving on to the next. The pumpkins were old by now, starting to rot, and my, back ma my bat made quick work of them. I had finished with the street in no time, my arm burning from the effort already. 
I had seen people peeking from their windows, but no blue and whites came to chase me. The work seemed too easy. The jack-o'-lanterns flying apart as I swung the bat, and I reveled in the feel of my anger and fear being sated. I would look back on that feeling throughout the years and feel deep shame. I was not challenged until 12th Street. I was getting cocky halfway through. I wasn't content with just a smash of the pumpkins anymore. I had started throwing them against trees, mailboxes, and houses. The man lumbered from the door, and I thought, and <clears throat> the man lumbered from the door, and though it was a little hard to see through the eye holes, I was pretty sure it was Mr. Baskey, my English teacher. He asked me what the hell I thought I was doing as he came striding out, and on a whim, I threw the pumpkin full in his face. He fell back, crashing into the end table, and lay on the floor amidst the debris. I, stepped, I started to step towards him, wanting to know if he was hurt, but something pushed me on instead. A chilling little voice I would become very acquainted with over the years. To hell with him. Your work must be fulfilled. I glanced back at the man for another second before turning back to continue. By the time I was finished with my work, I was near. it was nearly midnight. How had it taken so long? I had been so taken by the act of destruction that I had lost track of time. I was surprised that no one else had come out to challenge me and wondered how one how no one called the police yet. My clothes were spattered with pumpkin. My mask was now caked with dried seeds and goopy rind, but I didn't feel tired in the least bit. Quite the contrary, I felt an almost maniac <clears throat> manical need to see more pumpkins felled under my bat. I mounted my bike and rode downtown, feeling the cold breeze drive me forward. The breeze, the breeze felt like oncoming winter, and it seemed to lend me its power. I passed the remains of many smashed jack-o'-lanterns on the way. Chris and Kevin had been busy, it would seem. Tables had been turned over, the gaping holes from the pumpkins greeted me as I rode. They had thrown them in the street, they had been smashed on windows and on the storefronts, and they had scattered the guts of numerous gourds everywhere. It all seemed a little much. We hasn't agreed on this level of vandalism, but at the moment I was bold by the sight of so much destruction. This was his will, his who I thought, and he would reward us for our efforts. I saw, or felt I guess, the mist that was gathering over the town and its icy fingers were making chill bumps pop out of my arms. I found myself looking for the figure from my dreams, expecting him to appear in the mist and cackle. But if he were there, he was staying hidden. I found Kevin and Chris on the commons. The police were there, and their blue and white lights were cutting through the fog almost as well as the fire was. I gawked at the blaze, speechless. They had set the greenhouse on fire. They had set a prairie and called the police to us. I must have lingered a little too long, though. Someone pushed me suddenly, spilling me into the street, and fell on me as they wrenched my arms painfully behind my back. The fall had knocked the wind out of me, and I 
didn't have any strength to fight them off. When they lifted me to my feet, they shouted for me to get in the back of the squad car and stop resisting. I was walked to the standing vehicle and pushed into the back seat. It, sh <clears throat> it shimmied to the other side, wanting to see if my friends would escape. But what I saw was far from what I expected. Outside, Kevin and Chris were backing into the thick fog that swirled around the commons. The police were moving in, nightsticks in hand. The cop had cuffed me, moving up behind them as he yelled into the, his radio. He didn't seem to be reaching anyone though because I saw him jerk his head away as it crackled and sparked on his shoulder. He cursed and pulled off. He cursed and pulled it off, stomping on the box as it caught fire, looking away from his fellow officers as he tried to put it out. This is why he didn't notice the figure when it came out of the fog. I saw his red eyes first glowing from high in the fog as he came up behind my friends. He was tall, nearly eight feet, and I saw the two officers freeze as they noticed him. He came between my friends, a single hoof stepping from the fog as his horse parted the mist. His armored form came next, his arm, his armor forest green, his horned helm the color of moss, his sword shrieking like a wildcat as he drew it out. Kevin and Chris didn't even look at him, their pumpkin heads still fixed on the officers. I heard his laugh, his biting cackle from inside the car as he charged the officers and cut both down with a single slice of his enormous sword. It sheared through their nightsticks, their ballistic vests, and their flesh. The two fell to pieces on the commons as the third officer looked up in time to see the figure bearing down on him. I watched his head bounce off the glass as the rider took it off. And when he saw me, our eyes locked. That was when I knew he was the creature from my dreams. The voice I had heard, the winter wind that gave me strength. The green man had returned. He leaped the, the car and rode into town. Chris and Kevin followed mutely behind him. I provoked. I pivoted in the seat, screaming for them to let me out. I kicked the door, I kicked the glass until it splintered in a cascade of spidery cracks, but they were already disappearing into the fog. They left me there with the bodies. They left me there to take the blame. I kicked until my legs ached. I screamed until my throat felt like it would break. I pulled off my cuffs. I pulled at my cuffs until my wrists bled. I struggled and kicked like a child having a tantrum, but they still didn't come back for me. I'm in a jail cell now. No one seems to know what to do with me. They found me the next morning cuffed in a squad car. The bodies of three local officers nearby. Seventeen more deaths would be reported that night three fires, and too much vandalism to keep track of. Mark's party had been turned into a bloodbath, and the kids that had escaped were saying it was a guy with a sword and two guys in pumpkin masks with bats. The sheriff stood outside my cell for hours trying to get me to answer questions, but I refused to answer. When he couldn't get anything out of me, he told me a story instead. There's a mural in the museum. You've probably seen it a thousand times, but never really thought much of it. The settlers that founded this place came fleeing 
something they prayed they had left in the old country. That image on the mural, that's not English invaders, as we sometimes pretend for the tourists. Granddad said his granddad told him stories of the green man, a spirit of winter who sought sacrifice and punished those who would not give it his due. I sat silently. That's why we light jack-o'-lanterns. That's why the tradition is still here today. We light them that we might forget that demon that once haunted us. We light them because they keep him away. You've left us naked in the breeze, boy. You've burned our greenhouses, smashed our talismans, and now there will be nothing to stop them from coming back tonight. I continued to sit silently. Did you see him, boy? Did you see that devil? He wrung his hands over the bars, like a drowning man treading water, but I refused to answer him. After that, I sat for a few minutes. He left, and I haven't seen him in several hours. They didn't search me very carefully when they put me in here. They missed my lighter, my wallet, and especially my phone. I've been writing this down for the past hour, knowing my time is limited as the sun sets through the bars. I can see the fog gathering, and as it does, I can see the faces looking in through the bars. It's Kevin and Chris, the masks still looking grisly as they cover their faces, and I can hear the stomp of hooves behind them as his horse waits impatiently. The voice in my head is still telling me that they need one more. They need a leader. The mask I had been wearing falls through the bars at my feet. It's in my other hand, plastic feeling different somehow as I rub it between my fingers. I think I'm going to put it on. The voice tells me I have work to do. The green man calls me to action, and who am I to deny him? Hey guys, Children of the Night here, and I just wanted to say thank you for listening to today's story, whether it be on YouTube or on the podcast. The YouTube channel can be found at youtube.com slash children of the night or link in the description. And the podcast can be found basically anywhere you can find podcasts such as Spotify, Google, Anchor, like I said, pretty much everywhere. <laughs> if you are interested in supporting me more than you already are by watching either the podcast or on the YouTube channel, be sure to check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash children of the night. Or again, you can just use the link in the description. There you can get access to polls which dictate which horror story I'll narrate next. You can get voice acting roles in the podcast. Or you can get early access to these narrations so you can hear them before anyone else. Even if you donate just a dollar, it goes a long way in, you know, keeping the lights on and making the show in higher quality. So thank you so much for anyone who decides to do that. And if you are interested in seeing some just some horror related memes or just some minor updates, be sure to check out my Instagram page at children of the night one. And be sure to tune in every single Friday for brand new episodes of the podcast. But until we see each other again, I want to say good night and sweet dreams to all my fellow children of the night. Thank you.